Tonight we're going to have a, a Bible study, and that's uh, one of the, the beautiful um, and needful aspects of Wednesday night fellowship as we come together, as I have Bible study and study God's Word. And what a privilege it is uh, to be here, and be in one of his churches. And I didn't, um, I've, I've published the last few sermons on YouTube, I don't know if you saw that, but I got an opportunity to uh, listen to pastor preach Baptist Perpetuity, the one that he, that he got sick on that Sunday morning, and uh, I loved it, and it, it was a wonderful sermon, and uh, and it, you know, like he said, it's not a popular sermon, but it, it's just, uh, it, but it's true, and truth is hardly ever pos or, uh, popular. So, you know, it's, uh, it's one of those things, we, we do not compromise, but we're compassionate, and that's who we are. Uh, we do not compromise the truth to, uh, you know, get people in and, and everything, and you know, there's just a lot of deceived people out there that we see. One of the, the things that we've kind of been uh, singing about in our worship is about uh, the peace that comes from knowing the Lord and being saved. And if you open up with me to Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, the whole chapter is really a, the work that Christ did to save our souls, the work that Christ did to save our souls. You know, you've heard often that Christ finished his work and we put our faith in the object, and our object is Christ and his finished work. And we hear about Christ's uh, crucifixion, and it's near and dear to our heart. And uh, tell me the old, old story, and, and, you know, I will sing it, and we'll sing it forever and ever, and it'll be the same old story. And uh, we love to hear the story. I mean, sing it again, tell it again, preach it again, teach it, and uh, we get to listen to it again. But, you know, one of the things is we think about the work of Christ and we know that we put our faith and the fact that he has saved us and we put our belief and trust in him uh, as our savior. Uh, but I think it'd be good to look at five ways here in chapter five that what this work is. And um, it kind of divides it up uh, a little bit for us, but we'll start in Romans chapter five, verse one and go to verse 11. We, we may end up going more. But primarily in chapter 5 as we begin, it starts talking about this peace that we have. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So immediately, that, that is a very profound statement that you can just stop and meditate on and think about that. And, and get so much joy in your heart, and it's beyond the scope of even our understanding, the peace that we have with God because we're justified by faith through the work of Jesus Christ. And for, so for now on, as chapter 5 proceeds, it has this, this idea of peace. The ultimate lesson in this whole chapter is the peace that we have with God. We should be the most peaceful people in our hearts that there really is on the planet. There should be not a lot that shakes us because we have peace with God. That is real peace. The real peace is peace with God and the peace of God that comes into our hearts. That's not the message, but I wanted to uh, talk to you about the, the higher point here of chapter 5 is now we're riding on the coattails of what he just established, that we have peace with God being justified. Then he goes on to explain it in verse 2. By whom, Jesus Christ, also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So immediately we see we are in a different position in Christ. Because we're in Christ, we have access by faith, and we are positionally at peace with God. So we rejoice because we have this sure hope in the promises of God, and this sure hope that we even today are standing at peace with God because Jesus is our substitute and sacrifice. 
And not only so in verse 3, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Let me stop for a second and just... Uh, <laughs> there, there's a lot of amen verses here. Think about that. We have a peace that is the ultimate peace, that is the only peace that, that there really ever is for a human to have, in so much so that the things in our lives that aren't producing peace for you are there for a reason. It shouldn't rattle your peace. So we know, we understand God, we understand the sovereignty of God, we understand his, his um, providence in our lives, that even the things that distress us, even the things that are supposed to distress us, those things should not shake us. Even the tribulations in our life even works patience and patience hope. And so our peace is so strong, there's nothing that should dissolve it. There's nothing stronger than the peace that we have of God in this life. And so even when things come into our lives, we uh, even experience the love of God shed abroad in our hearts. It's, it's an experience that's drawing us even closer to the Lord, not further. It's an experience that's giving us more peace than we've ever had before, not less. And that's something. That really is something. That a tribulation can bring you more peace. That it doesn't equate. It doesn't sound right to the human ears. But the peace that God gives us, that we have with him and of him, is so much so that we rest in Christ, even so the things that should be shaking us are drawing us closer to the Lord. So there is a reason to rejoice as God's people. There's nothing in this life that should not be rattling our cage. And verse 6 is really where we want to start with the, the lesson tonight. I just wanted to give you that backdrop of the peace with God. This is going to be called the work of Christ to save our souls. And we're going to see five things that Christ did. First of all, in verses 6 through 8, we were sought out by his love. In verse 6, when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet preadventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So if you are logically dividing this chapter up, we had talked about justification by faith, which produces peace uh, with God, his work, and then he goes on now in verse 6 to start actually breaking down, unpackaging more of what Christ actually did, what his work actually was. And first we see that God commendeth his love toward us, that he loved us before we loved him. And salvation, the work of salvation, has the planted seed of love. He loved us. He loved us, and he gave. He loved his his elect. He loved his redeemed, and it says, he, his act in love, the proof of his love was his death. But God, in verse eight, commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, what did Christ do? He died for us. He died for us. He suffered, and then. Uh, you know, that's the activity of love, that it's one thing to say it, and it's one thing to demonstrate it, and that's how God has commended his love. And we see that his plan of love was in due time. In verse 6, for when we were without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. If you keep your fingers here and turn the Galatians 4.4, we see Paul mention this a couple more times throughout the scriptures. And um, you know, as, as I was studying this, this message, I got to thinking that's I know Christ died for me, and we're very we know that. That's something immediately, something very fast that you can just rattle off the tongue because you felt you feel that it's experiential 
But are we as fast to reply what the work that Christ actually did to save us? And how good it is that we can come here and, and we can look at these five points and remember these five points that salvation's uh, Christ's work and salvation was first that he loved us and gave himself for us. And that he proved the sincerity of his love by giving, but while we were yet sinners, enemies, Christ died for us. And so much so that in a, the fullness of time, as Paul, as Paul says it in Galatians 4.4, 4, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And so we see again this in verse 6, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. It was the fullness of time that Christ came. And according to the prophets of old, that Christ came on a scheduled time. The plan of his love was in due time. And now we know the proof of his love is when we were without strength in verse 6. And in verse 8, it says we were sinners. And in verse 3, or in verse 10, when we were enemies. Now look at uh, verse 10, it says, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So the first point we see here is that he sought us out by his love. The, the work of Christ to save our souls was planted in love. That he didn't just love the people who are lovable, but he loved us despite, despite us and saved us. And that is one of the reasons that we are unconditionally elected. You know, it's uh, when we are elected unto salvation before the earth even began that it was not anything that he foresaw in us. All of us are sinners. There, there's no one worthy to be saved. There's no one more worthy. We're all essentially the same. And the only thing that makes that, that is keeping me from being worse is God's grace, his restraint. And so, uh, you know, we only have the Lord to thank for that. You know, and it's, and it's one of those things that I, and I am, I am so joyful that our salvation, the security of our salvation, rests in the Lord. Because we know that there are diseases that we can get where you could get amnesia. Is a person with amnesia still saved? Yeah, if they were saved before, it, they're saved. What about a person that got Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's or any of these uh, genetic of mind diseases that uh, where you kind of forget and you just are um, I'm blessed and we should be thankful by God's grace that it's not me it's not the act of me keeping believing that's keeping me saved it's by God's grace and his sufficiency and his work and the fact that I am one of his and Lastly, uh, for his love, we see the greatness of his love in verse 7. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet preadventure for a good man some would even dare to die. And again, God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The next part of his work is we are justified by his blood. In verse 9, it says, Much more than being now justified, by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. The price of our justification is God's blood, his own blood. And his own blood is the only sufficient means for eternal salvation, eternal forgiveness through Christ. Because if you remember that the, bloods and the blood and the sacrifices was not good enough. It was an atonement. It was a covering. It did not purge the sin. It was an atonement, and they had to do it once a year. You don't have to turn there with me, but in Hebrews 9.22, it says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. 
It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So we see that the price of his blood is the reason that we are justified why he had to go once for all to the cross and shed his blood. And that became the atonement forever. He doesn't have to do it yearly like the priests after the order of Aaron. He's after the order of Melchizedek. And he shed his blood once. And that was sufficient forever. The precious blood of Jesus Christ. So we are justified by his blood and we are delivered from wrath. So the and the aspect of his work for us was him shedding of his blood to become our offering and sacrifice. And it says, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And a lot of the, um, you know, the, the scholars and the, the Greek and everything, there's a through him. And if you notice up here uh, in verse 10, it says, for if when we were re- enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son much more being reconciled we shall be saved by his life did you notice that it by his life and then in verse 9 it was from wrath through him so the the way that the language keeps going the some of these prepositions in the greek and it could have four or five different english words and so uh the the meaning i think that he's really getting at yes we are saved by his life but we're also saved in his life We're saved in his life because the rest of Romans chapter 5 deals with what it means to be in Christ versus being in Adam. So if you want to know what it means to be in Adam, you look at the opposite and where you are today being in Christ. We're imputed Christ's righteousness. Being in Adam, we were imputed Adam's guilt. So the, the way that the chapter is going towards being our position, remember early on it established our position. Our position was a judicial peace with God as our lawmaker, our law, our lawgiver, our, the one that we, uh, that we will answer to, all of us, anybody, everybody will answer to God. And so our position right now is peace, with peace with God. And so he starts early with the positional uh, of how we have hope because we are in a position in Christ, justified by his blood. So Christ's work was that he loved us, he gave himself for us uh, before we loved him. And the second is we are justified by his blood. And the only thing that could purge sins is Christ's blood. So without getting into a long uh, justification message, uh, I do love the, the, the topic of justification. I think you all know I do. But, um, so we will keep going into this other word that I like just as much. <laughs> Look at verse 10. It says it twice. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. I was, I was reading... Um, the word it was a word study on the word reconciled and how it's used in the the ancient greek there and the original language in the original language it has to deal with uh, the reconciliation of coin exchange so if you want to exchange coin for a different coin that is of equal value you would uh you would reconcile you uh you would take the, the the new coin and then give your coin that has equal value. But the word reconcile has an apo in front of it, which means that we are re-exchanged. The best way to put it is that we have gone back to a formal state. We were brought back to a formal state, reconciled. So it has the word re-re-exchanged. So... When we are reconciled to God, we are brought to God. We, we all understand that. The ministry of Jesus Christ and of salvation is called the ministry of reconciliation. 
We have been brought back to the relationship that Adam had with God before the fall. So we have been brought back to where before sin came. So our relationship with God is walking with him in the cool of the garden and talking to him. Christ has brought the ministry of reconciliation. He has brought us back to God where we originally were before Adam fell. And that be- it's a beautiful word that we've been reconciled, we've been brought back to God, and Jesus had to go and get us and bring us and buy us back. And um, that we, but it took his death to do it. So his work of salvation was he died for us that we should, could be reconciled, brought back to God. And so that also lends into the idea of that the end of verse 10 has more of the idea of we shall be saved in his life. It could be either by his life, but it could easily as well have been translated in his life as well. But in verse 11, it says, And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. And so we see that we are saved by his life and the the power of his resurrection. So we are saved in his life and positionally, in in our position in Christ, and we're also saved by his life and the fact that he has raised from the dead. So either way you take that word, (laughs) it works. We're, we're saved both ways. I mean, we're saved in his life, we're saved positionally in Christ, and we're saved by his life, by his, because he's alive. He was resurrected from the dead, and he is living today. Um, but we are secured by the atonement in verse 11. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. If you'll turn with me to Hebrews, I know we were just there, hopefully uh, you can turn over there with me, but Hebrews chapter 10, and we'll read 1 through 4, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1 through 4. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year, continually make the commerce thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers, once purged, should have no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year, for it, it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering would thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above, when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and Offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hast pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified, we are brought to God. That's another sanctification through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. There is another reconciliation, is sanctification is that he took us from where we were and has brought us to where he is and he has changed us. He, he, we are adopted into the beloved. We have changed ownership. We've changed our family. Our family name is no longer uh, in Adam, but it is now in God and his kingdom. The atonement brings us the joy that we see in Romans chapter 5. Let me get back there and I will conclude. So again in chapter 5, knowing that we've, we've read the work of Christ and his work to save our souls, that he sought us out by his love, 
We're justified by his blood. We're reconciled by his death. And we're saved in his life and by his life. And we're secured forever by the atonement. And think about the security we have in the atonement, that it's not something that we have to renew every year, like our tags, you know? I mean, it isn't. That's something they had to do in the Old Testament. They had to renew it every year. But those, that blood was not sufficient. You know, when we stand before Christ one day, I, I want to have this immediately on my mind, the admiration, the thankfulness, and the beauty of the work he did to save my soul. And it's a wonderful thing to meditate on the specific work he did to, to save your soul <coughs> and to study it out and to and admire the Lord even more. And you know what? The truth won't change. It'll always be the same. That when we see Christ, that we know that we're justified, we're in Christ, we're forgiven of our sins, we've been reconciled to God through Christ. Everything and everything is glory to Christ, the Lamb of God, which has brought us to Him. Even the, our election was by His grace. Nothing that good that I did. He just decided to give me gifts and bless me. And that was Him. And so you can see it wraps up well when you start looking at the peace that we have of God, with God, with the state at the beginning of chapter 5. And our position brings us peace. Peace despite tribulation. Because look at the sufficiency of the work which Christ did. And today we can leave the day being even more assured of our salvation. No matter what happens tomorrow, Christ did the work. And it was sufficient. And he has now sat down on the right hand of the Father. And now we're just waiting for our Savior to return and bring us home. And that's all I have for tonight. And I, I pray the Lord has blessed you. Brother Chapman, you want to come up and we'll uh, have a song.